So uh, thank you so much. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I would like to begin by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you today from uh, the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I want to pay my respects to their elders and families past and present. I would also like to uh, state that I feel the responsibility that their laws bring to us here at the law school. So my name is uh, Adil Hassan Khan. I'm a senior postdoctoral fellow at the Melbourne Law School, and I'm one of the conveners of uh, the Asia and Focus seminar series. Uh, and it gives me a, a great pleasure to welcome a fantastic uh, speaker for today, uh, uh, Sophia Twee. Uh, Sophia is a PhD candidate with the Initiative for Peace Building at the University of Melbourne's School of Social and Political Science. Her doctoral research focuses on the politics of peace building in the context of the ongoing Rohingya conflict in Myanmar's Rakhine state. And that uh, forms the topic of her talk today, which is titled Rohingya in Post-Coup Rakhine State, Navigating the Challenges and Exploring Opportunities for Citizenship and Statelessness. Mm -hmm. So um, first of all, welcome, Sophia. Uh, and before I uh, let you sort of um, uh, get started, I just wanted to say uh, Sophia will speak to for about 30 to 35 minutes. Uh, then we have about 20 to 25 minutes of time for comments and discussion. Um, and uh, just to remind everyone, uh, the seminar is being recorded and the recording will be made available later on our podcast and channel. So thank you so much. Uh, take it away, Sophia. Thank you, Eddie, uh, for your kind introductions. And as Eddie already mentioned, I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Melbourne, and my research focus on the politics of peace building, and especially exploring the local address dynamic in peace building, and especially the Rakhine context. So um, yes, uh, I have seen that uh, we have seen that international effort to address the the Rohingya crisis is like sometimes and often oversimplified and also focusing on the easy solution, which is complicated sustainable peace building effort. And so my research is my research aim is understanding the local realities and also local nuances and nuances and also. Um, the poten providing potential solution for the conflict. And so um, as part of my research, and I had uh, contacted my field work in the time in Mabora, as we all know that uh, I cannot go back to inside the Rakhine states as, mu as much as I would like to because of the political crisis and situation. So I contacted my field work in between uh, June and November 2023, and especially in uh, uh, time Yamabora as well as um, uh, in, even inside the Rakhine state and especially online interview. So I have interviewed like Daimba editors, like, including Rakhine, Rohingya, as well as other ethnic minority groups like um, you know, like Mio that and Kamen, also Chakama and Kami, Maramanji. So and um, including like um, 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 group leaders and also polit uh, Rakhine politicians or the civil society leaders and also including like religious leader, community leader, village leaders and activists. So it's included a lot of time bars um uh, address in which I interviewed this. And so today Drawing from the, my field work as well as our uh, previous experience, and I would like to talk about the post coup Rakhine and Rohingya conflict, and also what are the challenges and also opportunity for the Rohingya citizenship as well as the stateliness. Uh, I think like we have all the people who joined today with us that might aware that Rakhine State is relatively stable in early post coup political landscapes in Myanmar. And because uh, informal ceasefire between the Arakan army and also the military uh, regimes are uh, provided temporary stability in Rakhine state. And also that we have seen that the military regimes also work with the, some of the Rakhine leaders and also work with the, and also the, um, 
uh, remove the Araka army from the terrorist list to prevent conflict in an early uh, coup state. And during that period of stability, then Araka army, we have seen a lot of the um, uh, look, expanding the local governance and also judicial presence and also consolidating influence in both northern and southern uh, part of the Rakhine, Rakhine state. So, um, yeah, how about the tension actually resumed in like mid uh, 2022 and leading to new clash between Araka army and the military region. The reason I'm trying to explain a little bit about the dynamic between the different edges involved in post coup contest actually important to understand as like I mentioned that what would the um, conflict situation and the contest uh, the contest look like and also what would be the, the uh, opportunity look like. So at the same time, the junta, you know, we also seen that they wanted to exploit the regional tension between Rakhine, within even Rakhine communities and using like, you know, like Southern political leaders also supporting M groups like our collaboration party and because, you know, uh, they wanted to limit the the Araka army influence in growing influence in Rakhine state and Harpa. I think in uh you know the clashes uh to in in late two thousand twenty two it was was really remarkable because the Araka army capturing the Miau the symbolic capital of uh, Rakhine state and also that conflict and that tension that event actually led to humanitarian crisis in over 300,000 people being displayed in, and also uh, the, the military region trying to restore the airstrikes and civilian repression to regain control and as and that really is a great tension. And also, um, it is also important to highlight the dynamics of within Rakhine and resistance movement because uh, I think uh, later you will understand why I'm trying to uh, tear that, that the tension between uh, Arakan M groups because within Arakan M groups, like not like the way international uh, simplify like this one at uh, the Arakan army and then the Rohingya and also the not the military Judah. It's not like the way simple black and white. Actually, within even Rakhine and resistant movement, there are a lot of the competition and also division. And like, for example, like especially in the post post coup uh, conflict and environment. And because each group has the different vision of our future and also leading to significant recommendation within the nationalist uh, M group movement. For example, like these divisions are not only driven by the uh, political ideology differences and also shifting the power dynamic in, and within uh, the uh, post-coup uh, environment. So in like as we all know, the Araka army is becoming the uh the grow, uh, growing power and also becoming one of the uh, dominant forces in Rakhine State. And but their political vision is uh, the uh, confederations and the self determination, and which basically mean like they wanted to have the complete autonomy. At the same time, and the Arakan National Council, which is another M group in Rakhine State, and they actually have the their political vision is the federalisms and they wanted to have um they are more aligned with the other part of the Myanmar uh um political visions the federalism and which is um a, a different vision and another M group in uh, Rakhine State the Arakan Liberation Party they actually had this more aligned with the military regime and they have been working since the post uh coup that like they have been working with the military regions and to undermine the growing power of Arakan army. So we have seen within these um, three um, prominent M groups and of course the Arakan army is the most um, uh, 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 prominent M groups in within Rakhine state, but there's also other M edges and their power dynamics shifting, especially in post coup and also each edge had tensions, and especially the Arakan army arresting other like political uh, armed group leaders, especially the um the leaders from the Arakan Liberation Parties, and they had a lot of the tension in post coup, and also, um um the, not only these 
um, groups and when they are trying to do the uh, local governance and inclusive uh, governance in Rakhine post good contact and these alliances and competitions actually make it more difficult. And also when we talk about the post coup contest and also important to highlight the role of Rohingya armed groups in, uh, in the conflict, because uh, we have seen these, uh, the conflict started back in 2012 and 2017. The ASA was uh, one of the Rohingya armed groups, uh, which is uh, started in 2017 attack and also lead to the ethnic cleansing and genocide to Rohingya uh, uh, civilians. And so um, the, the, uh, uh, in the post-coup contest, like then there's also Arakan uh, Rohingya Solidarity Organization re-emerge and also they also have clash with these like uh, Rohingya and Gruzis. So um, especially uh, this is really complex and com conflict uh, scenarios in Rakhine State. And so between the uh, uh, Rohingya M groups like ASA and also uh, RSO, they are also competing and they also have a lot of the division and also being accused by working with the military region in, in order to balance the power, the, the Arakan army growing power. So at the same time, we have seen that these um, division and within Rohingya community, especially like, you know, in my research finding when I talk to different local editors and the civil society leaders and the way I found out is like uh, within Rohingya community and southern and northern part of the Rakhine state, they had different political uh, motivations. For example, the northern part of the Rohingya, they are more politically engaged and they want more uh, like, you know, like identity and citizenship and they wanted to identify themselves as Rohingya. But when I talk to the uh, Rohingya in the southern part of the Rohingya state, they are much more, uh, you know, like not politically engaged and they actually wanted to have to identify themselves even for example, like they wanted to identify themselves Rohingya Muslim, those kinds of these like division within Rohingya community also very interesting. So um, as like uh, at the same time, yeah, of course, like within Rakhine community, there are a lot of division, competition, tension. At the same time, Rohingya community, like, is also we are we're not seeing the prominent like uh, Rohingya leadership except that we have seen a lot of the international advocacy and activist role in the um, in the Rohingya side. And so there at the same time, at the local level, that, like I said, there's a lot of the division and, and a lot of different political motivation. So um, at the same time, the military region, they are manipulating this division within uh, our edges and also within the Rohingya community, as well as the between Rakhine and Rohingya. And so they are supporting and working with the different M groups. And at the same time, they are also giving different power and influences in different territory. So they actually had this strategy to intensify the ethnic tension between Rakhine and Rohingya. And obviously, and there has been a lot of success. And I would say, uh, because the uh, the tension between Rakhine stakeholders and Rohingya community is restarted and uh, like, you know, recently we have seen the news and a lot of issues coming out from the Budita amount of in the, the time uh, of the Bangladesh Myanmar border areas and a lot of attack and also both Rakhine and Rohingya Andrews are being accused of attacking civilians and a lot of human rights violations start again. At the same time, and the military junta, they started the conscription laws and since then they are working with the Rohingya and Gruzis like to recruit the Rohingya young people and in the military. And that tension actually led to the within Rakhine and uh, within Rakhine and Rohingya community and, and they created like you know underlying tension and they uh, re-emerges again. And so um Yes, like based on like different agenda, including military Judah, Rakai M groups, and Rohingya M groups, and also uh, at the same thing, the tension between Rakhai Arakan Army and also the international Rohingya as uh, activists also have been a lot of tension, like, uh, especially in the 2024 and 2023 because of the, the identity issues and 
the way the uh, Arakan army leaders and approach to the uh, uh, Rohingya identity is being in questions and uh, a lot of tension is coming out. So, um, Sorry, but uh, so as we reflect on the past and the present, it's really clear that like there's a lot of challenges past it. But I also would like to highlight today the new opportunity. What is uh, the opportunity in this like complex city and and complex com conflict environment in Myanmar and Rakhine State? So before the 2021 military coup and you know like talking about Rohingya rights and citizenship identity is is not only difficult but it was really dangerous so for example a device like that I talked to they were um, highlighting that they cannot even talk about the you know like smallest expression of solidarity with the Rohingya really carry like serious risk and they cannot even talk to like just a human rights violation especially in Myanmar they got threat not only from the the military region but also the Rakhine Burmese like nationalist groups and so it was really challenging but in the post coup uh, environment that actually changed the environment chain and the narrative chain and we have seen that that the military judah and repression to general population especially in Bami's majority area so they had a lot of the empathy coming from the uh, Myanmar com uh, community towards the Rohingya community and also other minority community so um where 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 was like taboo discussion you know like human rights justice inclusion for the Rohingya people are uh, now is becoming most uh in public space and uh, the attitude especially from the community is uh changing and also the activists like they can able to uh, you know talk about on the social media and also publish articles and public forum and also talking about this 1982 the citizenship law and so a lot of just and so I think it is really safe to say that there has been a lot of social social change regarding the Rohingya crisis and also the, the attitude it has been changed is in also within um, even Rakhine community that attitude has been changed and also I think uh, here I also would like to highlight the the role of Arakan army in you know like addressing the issue and tension and also the citizenship issue so when I was talking uh, in and interviewing different uh, stakeholders from the Rakhine community and group leaders politicians also civil society leaders one thing they all all, all uh, despite their different political vision and mission in Rakhine State, one thing they agree on that is uh, they all agree that uh, Rohingya deserve the citizenship. And this is one thing every, everyone agree on that. And they said also like uh, they really, uh, the Rakhine people and whoever in charge in the um, in Rakhine State need to build the, a great relationship with the Rohingya community. And that is one thing they really highlight about that. And also uh, interestingly, we also seen that um, before even my research uh, in early 2005, 19 and 2020 and 2021, we have seen that Arakan army actually demonstrated that, um, you know, like uh, their willingness and they are making progress, like, you know, building relationship within uh, Rakhine community and between Rakhine and the Rohingya community for ASML, like, um, the Arakan army supported to the you know like football tournament and in order to have the uh, relationship with the between Rakhine and Rohingya community so that kind of thing actually happened in early and pre cool uh, environment and we have seen that you know like civil society leader and working with the Rakhine and Rohingya civil society leader advocating for ch Rohingya children to be able to go to schools and also um some of the Rohingya um, you know, like they also mentioned when I talked to them, they were able to go to the Rakhine uh, villages and before it wasn't really imaginable. They don't really talk with the each other, Rakhine and Rohingya, they are afraid of each other. There's a lot of these underlying tension there, but pretty cool, like, you know, like one or two years from 2019 to 2021, there has been change, some positive changes happen, but um, since the UNAA like they started going to these um 
um, started to the uh, control the Rohan states, and there's a lot of tension coming out, in especially 2023 and 2024, in which we have seen that. And so I think um, one thing is like probably the most important thing is another is like at the Rohan states are uh, like in the community level, grassroots level, which my research focus on, and which who I talk to the religious leader, community leader. The one thing they mention is about is like you know they when the Rohingya people when they go out in public and they are not being in called by you know like this tank or gala which is really uh, offensive for the Rohingya community. So that kind of changes is already happening. And so, but the thing is, um, unfortunately, there is not so much political win at this uh, national level. And despite you know like NUG coming out the uh, Rohingya policy at the same time, all the many the Rohingya nationalists are are. are deny the fact that uh, Rohingya uh, and UG is interfering uh, these um the the in Rohingya 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 affair and they do not like the fact that but that and they deny that and so um there's still a lot of the uh, you know like political way which is not really translated into the action yet but at the same time uh there's a lot of the positive shift in at the community level some perspective within the leader and also you know like um the the, the political structure and there's some kind of found already changed so what i found is like probably the post coup environment of course there's a lot of challenges a lot of tension and and um fighting against uh, but that all the same time they also give a new opportunity for us like to reflect and to think and at the same time we have seen that the whole Myanmar is changing and you know like revolutions and we are in the uh period of like advocating for the new new Myanmar and imagining new Myanmar like where society is you know like diversity is um celebrated and a lot of social change and citizenship and equality and justice, that kind of uh, uh, conversations are happening across Myanmar. So it also affect in Rohingya state. And so um, of course there is, has to be like advocacy and also it has to be important, the important or dialogue between different community, between Rohingya and Rohingya at the same time, inclusive governance. And they all has to go hand in hand and with the political reform. So I think that this give it like opportunity uh, for us, like um, despite all the challenges, we also had to highlight and see how international community and with and co support to these um changing the some of the social chain and also to be to become like political chain as well. So I. Unfortunately, so far, I have not seen the dialogue between Rakhine and Rohingya leaders um, um, because I obviously dialogue is essential to move forward. And instead of like, you know, arguing and fighting and misunderstanding in the social media platform, I think what we really need is uh, Rohingya and Rakhine community coming up together and have a dialogue and also I mean, how to how to address the issue of citizenship and how to address the you know inclusive governance and how they can live uh, like in harmony together. That kinds of conversation are lacking at this moment. So, what international community actually could support is probably supporting these like uh imagine the dialogue between Rakhine and Rohingya leaders and and helping them out you know like to have the inclusive governance and it's undeniable the fact that um uh, the situation is still like um, a lot of tension between the military regime because of the military regime uh, manipulations and and the power uh, but <clears throat> manipulation between different M groups and also different community and also we have seen this like the military region or trying to do these like a religious based like tension and creating but in my research findings many local leaders already highlight that that 
people are aware of why the military propaganda is not working and why they should be careful the propaganda by the military. So there is a community level, a lot of awareness is actually that is um they that is very positive and of course like um even within the rock high community there are some many people I mentioned that we do not care much about you know like Rohingya identifying themselves as a Rohingya we respect that and that kind of is uh you know like attitude is like really impressive and remarkable because uh, before post coups and before that you know like back in 2017 and 2018 you know like calling Rohingya in front of them is really offensive in front of the Rohingya people so now they are like community leader they do not mind the fact that and so that kind of attitude is already changing so I felt like despite all these uh tensions and 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 um division within different groups and within then I I think there's also opportunity for us like to create this like citizenship and also what would the future look like for the Rohingya and also what would be the future look like that the whole Arakan, not only the Rakhine Rohingya, but also like I said when in my research I talked to different other ethnic minority groups like um the Kaman, Kaman and also Dainik and they will kinds of ethnic minority degrees also suffer from the conflict and also a lot of marginalization and discrimination. So if we as we have learned and through the Myanmar history and the conflict, and the, if you are not giving the opportunity and equal treatment to one group, to uh, uh, every uh, all the minority groups and there will be always like you know like um uh, like conflict and so we had to we had to create a like, space and we had to create this opportunity and equality and justice for not only like one group but all or but all who are living inside the Rohan state and especially in all in Myanmar. So um I think um the role is pretty long, but I am pretty um positive and because like a lot of uh, tensions and probably um like I said, like um that we, we just need to be positive and looking forward and what we can do and how we can do and, med and mitigate the tension when it comes. And thank you for sharing this with us here today at the seminar. Uh, and all the very best with uh, uh, finishing the PhD and the rest of the work. Uh, before everyone leaves, I wanted to uh, remind everyone, uh, we'll have the final uh, seminar uh, uh, for this series for this year in November. Uh, so please join us then. But in the meantime, thank you so much, Sophia. And um, goodbye to everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today.